So I want to out. I'm sure you're all very interested in hearing Rabbi Lappin. Rabbi Lappin, I already told you privately, but I want to say publicly that I apologize. I have to go teach tonight at Stern College for Women in Yeshiva University, and uh, I'm unable to get to my classroom in person, so I have to get on Zoom back at home in Yerushalayim, so I'm going to have to leave. I, I apologize. Birshot Maradatra, we're with Rabbi Atlas, thank you so much for arranging for me to come. It's always a pleasure to be here. I enjoy all the time that I spend in this incredible kihila and incredible congregation. I also want to thank uh, Marty and Irene Kaufman for figuring out a way how to get me to uh, be here this evening, and I thank you very much. I want to acknowledge the presence of Rabbi Cardozo, who is here, really honors me and all of us uh, with your presence. Um, and I see so many friends, so many friends of mine, personal friends of mine, acquaintances from over the years. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm really touched. I asked uh, Rabbi Atlas, maybe we'll have a minion, and I shouldn't feel too embarrassed, but Baruch Hashem, Shef HaBrachel, so many of you have decided uh, to come out, and I hope it will be worth your while, not only for sure for Rabbi Lappin, but for me as well. So let me learn in the Gemara. Do all of you have a handout or sitting next to somebody who has a handout? If you do not have a handout, please raise your hands. Okay, uh, if two people are sitting next to one another who have the handout, please pass it around. Um, we, I, I need you to look in because my focus is always on the text. I don't lecture to you, uh, I learn together with you. So we have to learn inside. So hopefully those of you who don't have a text will figure out what to do. The last, raise your hand, please. There's an extra one going around. It's a whole row in the back. Zev Weisberg needs a handout. We're optimistic, right? Okay, here comes another. There's another extra. Thank you very much. Okay, is another extra? And he called your hands up. There's an extra over here. So pass it over to your left or behind you. Okay. Okay, the Savior. Let's learn a piece of Gemara. Averish of another Lamakom Yom Kippur Mechapra, the last Mishnah in Masechet Yuma. Arrow, page one. When it comes to Averot Shebein Adam Lamakom, Yom HaKippur Mechaper, we're coming up to Yom Kippur, we're now, the Aseret Yemei Tshuva, we're counting down. When it comes to sins that we may have committed between us and the Rabboni Shalom, Yom Kippur is Mechaper. Averot Shebein Adam Lechavero, En Yom HaKippur Mechaper, Ad Shiyaratze Et Chavero. It's not enough. Come inside. Bakasha, welcome. <clears throat> There's some seats over here. Make yourself comfortable. Baruch Hashem. When it comes to interpersonal sins, Yom Kippur is utterly irrelevant. And the only way to get kapara for Averot Shubin Adam Bachavero is we have to ask for mechila from one another. Yom Kippur is very beautiful. But we need to do the work. And we have to ask one another for Mechila. Baruch Rabbi Loza ben Azariah. Mikol chato teichem lifnei Hashem titharu. Famous Pasek that we are going to be repeating over and over and over again. During the Tfilot on Yom Kippur, ki bayom azei yechaper alechem letaher etchem. Mikol chato teichem lifnei Hashem titharu. Mikol chato teichem lifnei Hashem Namely, Averot Shaben Adam Lamakom Yom Akipur Mechaper, Averot Shaben Adam Lachavero, Ain Yom Akipur Mechaper, Ache Yeratzet Chavero. So what Rabbi Loza Ben Azariah does, he quotes a Pasuk, and then he repeats again exactly what the Tanakhama says, word for word. This uh, 
text is quoted in the Ein Yaakov, page two. The Ein Yaakov, written by Rabbi Yaakov ben Chaviv, who uh, lived into the uh, 16th century. He was the rabbi in Salonika of the Spanish exiles who came to Salonika after the Spanish expulsion. And the Ein Yaakov is a collection of mostly homiletical passages in the Bavli, and he brings them together. And once in a while, he also has halachot. So here, right at the top of the page, in the middle of page two, we have the same minor chazal that we saw. There is a parish on the Ein Yaakov called the Rif. The Rif is not the Rif who we know and love, who is in the back of the Gemara, <clears throat> Yitzhak Al-Fasi, who lived in the 11th century. Obviously, he can't have written a parish on the Ein Yaakov, which was produced in the beginning of the 16th century. So there's a new riff. I want to introduce you to a new riff. This riff is Rabbi Yoshia Pinto. Pinto is a very famous Sephardic family. Rabbi Yoshia Pinto, who lived into the middle of the 17th century. He died in 1648. He was a Makubal. He lived in Damascus. And he wrote a perush on the En Yaakov. Rabbi Yoshia, not Yeshayahu, Yoshia Pinto, ratio pay the riff. The riff asks five questions on the words that I read to you and also the next few words in the Mishnah. I'm interested in the first question of the riff, Rabbi Yoshia Pinto. The Kashyalan. I'm sorry that the letters are so small. For some reason, as I get older, the letters get smaller. I'm not sure exactly how that happens, but that happens. So Listen along, I'm going to read it to you, and hopefully it'll be clear. V'kashilat. Ma hosif od Rabbi Lezer ben Azariah lidrosh yoter meha'amur kodem. What is Rabbi Lezer ben Azariah mosif to the Tanakhama? What did the Tanakhama say? Tanakhama said, Averot shebein adam lamakom yom ha-kippur mechaper, Averot shebein adam v'chavero, en yom ha-kippur mechaper at shiratza et chavero. Comes along Rabbi Lezer ben Azariah, quotes a Pasuk, and then repeats the whole thing all over again. What does he come to add? If he comes to add the Pasuk, so the Mishnah should have said, Amr Rabbi Lezer ben Azariah, how do you know? Because the Pasuk says, Ki bayom hazeh yechapra aleichem letaretchem mikol chato techem lefnei Hashem detarim. If it's an Avera lefnei Hashem, then Yom HaKippur mechaper. But if it's an Avera ben Adam b'chavero, then Yom Kippur is not b'chaper. So if it's only to provide a proof text, I would say, how do you know? And he quotes the proof text. Why does he have to repeat word for word again exactly what the Tanakhama just said? Azoi Frek, the Heliger Rif, your new friend, Rabbi Yoshi Pinto, inside. The Kashalan, Maho Sif Od, Rabbi Lezer ben Azariah, the whole Sipur all over again. to repeat the whole thing again. Because Ella, Amr you hear the question. I think it's a fair question. It's a reasonable question. He simply repeats word for word why. What is he adding to the Tanakhama? If he's adding the Pasuk, quote the Pasuk in Gamarnu. Why do you have to repeat? So the Rif, Rabbi Yoshia Pinto, has this incredible, scary interpretation. It's a massive Chiddush. I want to bring this to your attention, and invite you to think about it. But counting down now the Yom Kippur, things are beginning to ratchet up, quite serious, something to think about. He has five questions, and now he answers. Venera la neos it's in the second long line, about a couple of words in. Venera la neos listen to this. Sherbalozib and Azaya darasha mikra, 
he learns from the Pasik, Lifne Hashem Titaru, Umin Menu Shana Lomaris follows. I'll explain to you outside first. I thought for my whole life that Pshan in this Mishnah is when it comes to my relationship with God, Hashem, I'm sorry. I don't know, I missed the mincha, I ate something, I did something, I feel bad. Oh, we're good to go, Yom Kippur is macha. Put me a big check in the sky in JJ's book. Okay, we're good to go with God. Now it comes, Ben Adam Lachavero. It's not going to help me. I have to ask for Mechila, but at least this part is done. This part I have to work on. Kuntz again, the riff, Rabbi Yoshia Pinto, and said as follows. What Rabbi Lezab and Azari is adding here is as follows. He's saying, Averot shebein adam lamakom yom ha-kippur mechaper. Averot shebein adam lachaveiro ein yom ha-kippurim mechaper even for Averot shebein adam lamakom ad sheyeratze eschaveir. In other words, it's not as if there's this sort of schizophrenic Understanding, I'm good to go when it comes to ben adam lamakom, but ben adam lachavera. I have to ask for mechila. If I don't ask for mechila, ben adam lachavero, I am nowhere. It's not as if this is good. Check in the sky, gamarnu, and now I have to worry about somebody else. If I don't worry about somebody else, if I don't ask mechila, then I don't even have any kapara, any slicha yom akupur mechaber, even. I can clap for Heinz Bergen, Alchei, Toshamnu, till I till I have a pain in my heart, and my heart is it's it's inside out now, it's it's pushed in. Doesn't matter anything. I am nowhere on Yom Kippur zero unless I ask Mechila from somebody else. That's when it comes to the Tanakama holds. The first opinion is like we always thought. Good to go. I'm okay with that, but now there's a new category I have to ask. Comes again, Rabbi Lazar ben Azaria, and says, He repeats the whole thing because he wants to add that at all. That's what he's adding. That's why he repeats it. Look inside. So beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, you understand? Now we understand why is it that he went out of his way to say the same words? Yes, yeah, the same words, but it's cataclysmically different. It's a mess of Chiddush here. It's actually scary. Because I always thought at least me and God, we got a thing. You know, like we we, we understand one another. You know, we, we have a relationship. Well, we'll figure it out. Never have to ask somebody else. If I hurt somebody, I have to mind. It's hard. It's very hard. I find it much easier to talk to God than to be ask Mechila from somebody who I hurt. No, you know, God knows me. We, we have a thing. We to face somebody and ask them for mechila, which means that you hurt them, which means they know you hurt them and you have to fix it, it's not easy. But now, I now catapulted this sky high. Because if I don't do that, then even Averot Sheben Adam Lamakom leaves me absolutely cold. Yom Kippur Rahim, Yom Kippur Aher, I'm done. Nothing, zero. I have to ask Mechil. As they say in the Hale of big Chiddush, the Kasha is a good Kasha. Why does he repeat? Because you just quoted a Pasik. The answer is, as long as 
עבירות שבין אדם לחברו, יום מרצה את חברו. And I say that it's daunting. It's daunting. So we'll think, I'm thinking as I'm talking, so who do I have to go to to make Yom Kippur at all efficacious? Who do I have to fix? Who do I have to embarrass myself by going to and asking for Mechila? And hopefully that person, the Shulchan Aruch says, that somebody asked for Mechila, you should... Give Mechila a second time, certainly a third time. So I want to share two interpretations with you. One comes, page three, from the Tzavo Mechaim. Tzavo Mechaim, Rabbi Chaim Palaji. Rabbi Chaim Palaji lived until 1869. He was a Chacham Bashi. He lived in Izmir, lived in Turkey. He was born in Izmir. We have 26 foreign that were written by Rav Chaim Palachi, which only leads me to believe there were probably 36 or 46, but they got lost somewhere. He was an incredibly prolific writer. We have 26 Sfarim from him, including Tzava Amichai. Amrina Biyuma, right side, page three. Averot sheben adam lamakom yom ha-kippur mechaper, Averot sheben adam lechavero en yom ha-kippur mechaper, at shiratz et chaver, v'katav harith. Now you know, he's our friend. It's not the end of Rif. Hashem yipiv on Uchayim. Forever. It's not that Rif. It's a new Rif. The Agadeta. Agadeta is the Ein Yaakov. It's coming to under the Yaakov. What does he say? The Cholot she'eno meratzeh et chaveiro. Gam ma she'beno lebein hamakom. Eino mechaper. Ye'u yan sham. We just did that. V'yesh la teita'am ledava. ואם אדם בא להיות מתרצה למקום בחטאים שיש לו בינו לבין המקום, אם כן כשמקשה אורפו למה שחטא עם חברו, שהתורה חייבתו שיפייסנו, whatever it is, be it this, be it that, end of the next line, אם כן כשבואי בזה, namely, in trying to rectify his responsibility, her responsibility to another human being, the same Torah that says you have to keep Shabbos says we have to l'recha kamocha. It's in the same book. It's in the same God's word. So what are you telling me? This part of Torah, I'm asking for Mechil. Another part of Torah, Mechil. You know what? I'm going to pick and choose. I'm going to care about Shabbos. I'm going to care about Kashrus. You know, that, to be nice to somebody, that, 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 that part I'm going to, like, forget about. What are you talking about? It's in the same tone. So how can it be that this part of Torah, you're good to go, the other part of Torah, Benach Michael? Can't be. So therefore, if I reject this part of Torah, so what does it mean? Where am I adopting for myself and accepting the sovereignty of God? Kabbalat o malchut shamayim, recognizing that Hashem is the Noten HaTorah, it's in the same Torah. So it's one package deal. It's not bifurcating. So the same Torah that says, Ben Adam Lamakom, says Ben Adam Lachavero. And if I don't ask Mechila, Averot Sheh Ben Adam Lachavero, then ain't Yom HaKippur Mechapi for anything, because I've just rejected a part of God's Torah like the other part of God's Torah. Azoi Zokt, Reb Chaim Palaj. בכל עוד את אין דנשאר מה שבין אדם לחברו אינו טהור ונקי לפני השם מכל חטאותיכם לפני השם תבהרו God you know what this part of Torah I don't know no, that's not for me that's too hard you know, you know I'm going to muddle but forget that what do you mean forget that you expect that God should forgive you when you just ripped out a piece of God's Torah, makes no sense. V'zeh barur. It's obvious. So you hear the Chiddush. Unless you've straightened out that part of Torah, then you are nowhere when it comes to Yom Kippur. Answer number one. 
Answer number two is the Binyan Ariel on the left side of the page. Binyan Ariel, was Rab Shaul Amsterdam. Rab Shaul Amsterdam was the chief rabbi of Amsterdam, was the son of Rabari Leib. Rabari Leib was the husband of uh, Miriam, who was the daughter of Chacham Tzvi Ashkenazi. So we have Chacham Tzvi Ashkenazi, a Chosh He died in 1718, very famous, Shal Sotshuvah's Chacham Tzvi. Chacham Tzvi had 15 children. The oldest daughter, Miriam, married Rabari Leib. Rabari Leib became the chief rabbi in Amsterdam after a career of being a rabbi in a few smaller congregations. He died in 1755. When he died, his son, Rab Shaul, became the chief rabbi. He writes a sefer called Binyan Ariel. In the middle of the right column, underlined, the katvu kama gidolim v'gam harif ve'en ya'akov. We know exactly what he's referring to. She'im lo tikein ha'adam averot sheveno mechaveiro, ein yom ha'kipur mechaper af al ha'averot sheveno lemakom. Parenthesis, the near litan lachon lazer yitvaer lekamai. He drops the rish. You have to have the whole package, otherwise you have nothing. I have a good reason. Keep on turning the pages. I'm going to tell you the reason. Here it is on the left column. First full paragraph, left side, page three. We saw one answer. It's one Torah. Can't split the Torah. Now we have another answer. Kimitzad hasvara lo yitzdak lefanav Kol chai, af al yidei tshuva. Al asher lo asa et ma'amar malko shel ola. He raises an issue that I think is absolutely fundamental. How does tshuva work? We're now in the middle of a serious made tshuva. We're coming up to Shabbat tshuva. Mahalt nine tshuva. We have to do tshuva. We have to do tshuva. Tshuva is absolutely ludicrous. It makes no sense whatsoever. Why? I'll give you a muscle. I tell my students, I teach at Yeshiva College, I teach uh, Stern College, I teach graduate school. I tell my students, do me a favor. I'm begging you, don't put it in an email. Don't post it on social media. I'm begging you, because if you do, and you're now a kid, so it's a joke, and what difference is it going to make? And you think it's cute. So in four years from now, when you want to get into graduate school, or in seven years from now, when you want to get a job, they're going to check on you. Every employer does a search. And they want to see me, and they're going to see some stupid marriage kind. And it's going to hurt you. And you're going to have to explain, as I, Yahina, here, Every word that you put online, you send an email, you put it on Twitter, on Schmitter, on Facebook, on whatever it is, it is la'ad u'lenetzach It doesn't go away. There was once, not long ago, somebody running for the president of the United States. There was a huge tunnel, about 7,000 emails from God knows how long ago. A couple of elections ago. But I don't understand Shuva. You forgive me. You did it. You did it. You 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 ate the thing. You postponed the thing. You didn't uh, this. I hear you fill in the blank. You weren't nice to somebody. Where does it go? Where does it go? It's okay. It's okay. Donos nase kishkodos. Donos nase kezachios. How do you erase something that you did? I'm asking the most fundamental question for this time of year. You're telling me tshuva, tshuva, bar Hashem, tshuva, tshuva. How? How can you? You feel bad. You're distraught. Terrible. Horrible. Sad. Embarrassed. It's all good. 
But you know what? You did it. You did it. How do you take back something that you did? Atyadekach, then on page four, Rabbi Salavechik in Ahla Tshuva points out that philosophers, and he quotes here Nietzsche and Spinoza, could not accept the concept of tshuva whatsoever because it's totally illogical. It makes no sense whatsoever. You'll read page four on your own. Azoi frekt the heilige aria. In order to understand the riff, he poses this question. I'm going to read it again. I'm doing tshuva. I'm sincere. I'm honest. I'm heartbroken. I'm embarrassed. Okay. Beautiful. You're a sweet guy. Very nice. But where does it go? Alasher lo asat ma mar mal kosher lo la. So listen to his answer. Aval midat chazdo yit barach im ha adam limdod lo kemidato. Fascinating. We think that we follow God. Vahalachta bedracha mahu chanun. Right, fill in the blank. Afato chanun mahu racham. God acts in a certain way, and we act in accordance with the way God acts. Once again, the Binyan Ariel says it's the other way around. God acts like we act. Namely, why will God do a chesed? What is tshuva? Tshuva is a gift that God gives us. It's straight out gift. Makes no sense. It's illogical. It's strange. It breaks every concept of logic, but the Rabbani Shalom says, I'm giving you a chesed. Doesn't I have to be logical? God gives us, when does God give us a gift and forgive us? When God sees that we forgive our friends. When our friends come to us and we have to make sure they come to us or they have to come to us and we forgive, then God says, okay, wow, what a sweet guy. What a wonderful lady. She's forgiving somebody else. You know what? Forgive? I'm going to forgive. But if I don't forgive, and I don't ask for Mechila, and the forgiveness is not forthcoming, then God says, Who needs? I'm not going to do you a chesed. God does to us what we do to one another. It's the inversion. Of Mahuchana. We don't follow God, but God follows us. It's an amazing Chiddush. Avomidat chazdo yitvarachim adam limdod lo kemidato ukefima asav im basar vadam kemoto kach hakadosh borchu osei imo shemishave et midotav im midot basar vadam afa pi she'en laham erech ze im ze. Right, there's no comparison. Why is it that the riff is right? Says the Binyan Ariel. Why is it that if I'm not mechaper, I don't ask for mechila and I don't give kapara to someone else, that I am nowhere, that God doesn't give me kapara for ben adam lamakom, it's obvious. Why should God ever give me kapara for anything? It's only a chesed. To whom is God going to do a chesed? To someone who does a chesed, you do a chesed, I'll do it. Tshuva makes no sense. The Rambam says, beginning of Hilchos Tshuva, that Yeshayas the Tshuva v'yoshuv mecheto chayav leisvados ketzad mevad misvadim amar chatosi avisi poshati lefanecha v'asisi kach v'kach v'harei ani michamti uboshti v'asisi kach v'kach at least. What is Vasisi Kach Vakach? You have to fill in the blank. You have to fill in the blank. I want to tell you a story. In the 1980s and the 1990s, I was a rabbi of a very fancy shul on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Some of my lovely, wonderful former congregants are here, and I'm very touched by your presence. It was a very philanthropic congregation. 
And many organizations wanted to cultivate relationships with me because they felt that through me, they would be able to raise money for their very, very worthy causes. One of them was the UJA Federation of New York. And I had a very close connection. This was a Klag Yisrael Tzedakah. It gave money and supported all kinds of Jews, also non-Jews in America and in Israel. The year is 1991 and the month is May. May of 1991, those of you of a certain age will remember Operation Solomon. What's Operation Solomon? Israel engaged in an airlift effort to bring close to 15,000 Ethiopian Jews to come to Medinat Yisrael. And so I got invited with a few other uh, rabbis, all kinds of rabbis from uh, Manhattan, to fly to Israel for two days to see what was happening. We come to Israel, we go to sleep in the hotel, they wake us up at three in the morning, put us on a bus, they take us out to the airport. It's pitch dark outside, we go on to the tarmac. And we're waiting, and Sabislach, little by little, we see light coming down, it's pitch dark, it's now uh, 4.30 in the morning, and a plane lands. Hundreds of Ethiopian Jews pile out of the plane. The first thing they do, every one of them, is they hit the deck, they kiss the stinking, smelly tarmac, right there in the airport. Not just they bend over, but Pishut Yadayim Varaglayim. Mom sprawled out on the floor. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. They took out the seats from the airplane. You can see pictures of this, and they're on the floor to just snip it as many as they could. I'm standing there, and I'm watching this. I'm overwhelmed. And then the Ethiopian Jew comes over to me. So he, I'm Harik, he speaks I'm Harik, but he picked up some Hebrew. Efo Beit HaMikdash. He says to me, Efo Beit HaMikdash, I'm totally stunned. I'm floored. I'm stuttering. I have no idea how to answer. Efo Beit HaMikdash. And he's upset that I'm not giving him, you know, you make a right and a left, the Az Tishal, Shama Yamin, Asmola. And he pulls out of his robe. He didn't have pockets. Didn't have pockets. He had like a billowy robe. He pulls out from somewhere a notebook. Not even a notebook, like a pad. <laughs> a little pad, maybe three inches by two inches with the spiral on the top. And somehow he makes me understand that here there's a list of a virus that he did that he has to bring a carbon chatos. And he kept track of them in Ethiopia. And he was hoping when he comes to Eretz Yisrael will come to you with Shalayim and he'll discharge his obligation with Korbanus. I am totally floored. And I have to explain to him, Ain Beit HaMikdash. He never got the memo that the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. I didn't know how to say it to him because I couldn't talk English to him. I couldn't talk Hebrew to him. And I didn't know in his culture what this means what this means, what this means. I, didn't, I, I was afraid to say anything, do anything. <clears throat> he was very frustrated with me. He walked away. How many of us have a notebook? I don't even have a notebook. I don't even know what I did. What do we tell our loved ones? We tell our loved ones, I, I you know, I don't. I didn't even know what I did. Yen a Tuesday. I forgot. I didn't take out the garbage. I, I said something that wasn't nice. I love you. I would just want to. I love you. I, whatever it was. I'm sorry. Let's 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 get together again. Let's have a relationship. What do we tell the Rabbonu Shalom? We tell the Rabbonu Shalom. I don't even know what I did anymore. I know I did stuff. Big S, capital S, stands for stuff. I did stuff. I'm sad I did stuff. I shouldn't have done stuff. I'm asking for Mechil. What does the Rambam say later on in Hilchus Tshuva? Achi Ikro shall vidu when it comes to Yom Kippur. Fatasi Avisi Poshati Gamarnu, that's it. You don't have to be Mechari. Achi Ikro shall vidu. You say, I'm sorry. We don't have a notebook. This man had a notebook. It's astounding. We don't have a notebook. So how does tshuva work? Why should tshuva work? 
God, I'm sorry I messed up the big S. Big S, lot of stuff. I'm sorry. And Hashem says, I'll do a chesed. Straight out chesed. Makes no sense. Facebook, Twitter, emails, la'adol and netzach netzachem, but I'll do a chesed. When will Hashem do a chesed? Says Rabbi Shaul Lowenstam, chief rabbi of Amsterdam in the second half of the 18th century. When you do a chesed. When you ask somebody for mechila, which you have to do, and that person gives you mechila, then Hashem will give us mechila. Look at the Yerushalmi at the bottom of the page. There's a Yerushalmi in Maseches Makos. <clears throat> it's probably the last place that you'd look for such a Maimer Chazal. Zokt the Helege Yerushalmi. Sho'alu Lechachma, underlined, bottom left, page three. Sho'alu Lechachma. Chote mahu oncho. They ask wisdom. So what happens when somebody sins? What are the implications? Amr lahem chatoim terade fra'a. They should be pursued by evil. Chachma says, you did something wrong. There are consequences. You have to pay for it. You have to be punished. Shalu lenevua. Chote mahu oncho. That's it, you're done. He tomos. Hanefeshatas. Nivua says, What do you mean? What happens to a chote? It's obvious what happens to a chote. You pay up, you did something wrong. There are consequences. Shalu lokucha beriachu chote maoncho. Amr lahen yasa chuva. God says, I say, what should happen to a chote? Yase, tshuva. Because I'm giving you a gift. It's only a gift. And it's only a gift if you are prepared to convey that same gift to someone else. Somebody else asks you for mechila, which they should, because if they don't, I know where. Averos, Adam Lachavera, and Yom Kippur and Mechaper for anything. Chaim Palaji says the reason is because it's in the same Torah. It's a very compelling answer, Chaim Palaji. You can't pick and choose which part of the Torah you want. This part I like, this part I don't like. It's the same Torah. If you're not going to take this part of Torah seriously, then the whole thing. Vosep is my relationship with the Rabbani Shalom. Rav Shol Lowenstam, the Binyan Ariel says, you have to ask and you have to grant Mechila, because otherwise why should God grant you Mechila? It's only a chesed. It's a massive chesed. When I come to Yom Kippur, the whole day I'm thanking God for the opportunity to do true. I am utterly cognizant of the chesed, the gift God is giving me today, an unbelievable gift. I don't deserve it. Makes no sense. Shouldn't happen. Him says, Shalom, could you be a chushtet in Yerushalmi and Marcus? I'm going to give you a gift. The power of the significance of understanding and appreciating. I want to conclude on page five. Rabbi Atlas, another three, four minutes, because you, you had a great introduction of all the programs that are happening here. So I, uh, I know you want to hear Rabbi Lappin. Rabbi Lappin, is it okay if I take four more minutes? Okay, thank you. you. You're doing a chesed to me. The Rabbeinu Shalom will do a chesed to you, Mir Hashem. Not like you need it, because but, but Tama Khalili, you may need Epis, you're good to go. The Gemara says in Bava Basra, Daf Tezayinu Medalef, Penina L'Shem Shamayim Nishab. Who's Penina? Penina and Chana. So we know the famous Haftorah, 
We know the psukim. <coughs> Chana, Nebuch didn't have children, and Penina had a lot of children. The Chiasata, Tsarasa, and Penina made life difficult for Chana. Penina made life difficult for Chana. She provoked her, she don't know exactly, angered her, embarrassed her. Stayed in Gemara, it was L'shem Shemayim. Penina, L'shem Shemayim Nishav. Nevertheless, Chazal tell us, I don't even want to say, a terrible punishment happened to her. Terrible. I'm going to read it inside it. I'm not going to translate it. Terrible punishment. Dr. Chaim Shmulevitz and the Sichas Musa. What's the implication of this? Dr. Chaim Shmulevitz was the Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshivat Mir. I was here for close to two years in 1968 to 1969, learning in the Mir Yeshiva in Yerushalayim. Rabbi Chaim Shmulevitz then was the Maloi He was not only the Rosh Yeshiva, but he also gave Sichot Musa. And a number of the Sichot Musa were written up in the Sichos Musar of Rab Chaim Shmulevitz. And with this I conclude. When somebody hurts another human being, even with the best of intentions, and L'Shem Shamayim, you're playing Literally, we'll see in a second, with fire. I just read to you the Gemara in Bava Basra Tezayin and Medalach. He, L'Shem Shamayim Nit Kavna, V'Afo Pikein, and here it comes. Ne'ensha ba'ofen chamur kol kach shemeitu kol baneha. And it's it's incomprehensible. V'Afo Pi, listen to how Rav Chaim learns Pshat in this Gemara. She was mamish a hilige voile zisa durch ye arbeta tzadikis. She was the epitome of piety, Penina was. Ubevadai haya kasha la maud mitza eret chan. You think it was easy? But she just flippantly wanted to make Chana feel bad. It was painful for her to do this. She wanted Han to feel a little bit worse. And if she felt a little bit worse, she would dive in a little bit harder. And if she dive in a little bit harder, maybe that would put her over the top that the Rabbani Shalom would respond to her. The whole point was that she should dive in with greater fervor, even greater than the way she was davening until now. That was the point. It was killing Penina to do this. But the whole point was, L'shem Shamayim, she wanted to help Chana. She wanted to push Chana over the edge, over the line, so that maybe with the extra little kavana, with the cry, that would arouse Rachme Shamayim. V'chomasha asta lo asta elo lahaviya l'deit filah. She overcame her tzaddikus kite in order to do something that was so hurtful for her to do and so hard for her to do and so painful for her to do only to be able to help Chano Why? She's such a tzaddikus and it's l'shem shamayim. You hear so much L'shem Shemayim, I'm doing it, L'shem Shemayim. You hurt somebody, L'shem Shemayim, terrible things are going to happen. Why? Ki ha-pogea b'chavero. Yihiyu machshivotav asher yihiyu. Whatever you're thinking about when you're pogea b'chavero. Harehu ki machnis yado letoch tanur eish. You've just stuck your hand in a fire. But you have a baby, and the baby is 18 months old, just beginning to crawl, crawls over to the stove, and there's something boiling, there's a pot boiling on the stove, and 
the kid is starting to pull it down and you put your hand in to save it from the kid, you know what happened to your hand? Your hand just got burnt. You didn't want to burn your hand. You wanted to save your child, but it doesn't matter. You stick your hand in the fire when you hurt somebody. It's a physical reality. Reality. So when you hurt somebody, I don't care what your kavana was. The shame shemayim tzaddik is unbelievable. You just stuck your head, your hand into fire. You just get burned. Kenila l'shem shemayim nischavna, and the implications were beyond comprehension. The power of the danger of hurting somebody else. And we learned this evening that we have to fix that. And there's a lot riding on us fixing that because what's riding on it is not just what's riding on it, namely our relationship with one another, but the Hele Gerif, Rabbi Yoshi Pinto, Zolahab Malichtig Mganed, Rabbi Yoshi Pinto, Hello Shalom Aleichem to a new riff, says that's Pshat in Rabbi Lozan and Nazar. Why does he repeat word for word the Lushan of the Tanakhama? Because he's telling us a big Chiddush. Tanakhama says this and this bifurcated. I can take care of this and I have to take care of this. If I don't take care of this, I still took care of that. Comes again Rabbi Lozan ben Nazaria and says no. If you don't take care of a Nodom Bachavero, we're nowhere. Rabbi Chaim Palaji is in the same Torah. Show Amsterdam, why should God forgive you if you're not going to forgive anybody else? If you're not going to ask and receive Mechila from anybody else, why should God forgive you? The whole thing is a chesed, it makes no sense. As we count down to Yom Kippur, we should uh, take this seriously. And Mitz Hashem, with our sincere efforts to try to rectify ourselves both in terms of our relationships. To God and to one another, Kaddish Baruch Hu should taka, grant us chesed and uh, give all of us netz Hashem for us, our families, and for Kal Yisrael Eshnas Chaim Vishal. Thank you very much, Rabbi Shachter, for a fascinating talk. There's now going to be another talk. It's going to be shorter. Rabbi Lapin is going to speak under half an hour, so don't worry. Am I correct, right? Under half an hour? Yes. And thank you very much, Rabbi Shakir asked us to all look outward to the other. And I think what Rabbi Lapin will want to do is now to ask us to look inwards to ourselves. Rabbi Lapin, thank you very much. I'm just going to say that Rabbi Lapin was not feeling well this morning and was not sure whether he will come, but he came despite everything. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rav Atlas. Thank you, Rav Shafter, for your beautiful words. Wonderful to see my very old friend, Rav Cardozi, here. Wonderful to have you and see you with us. And good to see all of you this evening. Thank you to all of you. Some years ago, a group of wise people, 75 of them, they were members of the Stanford Graduate School of Business Advisory, Advisory Council, gathered together to think about an important question, and their answer is something that is used all the time until now, and that is, of all the different midot, of all the different character traits, which is the most important for effective leadership? For a leader to be effective, what about his or her character is most important to get right? A Muslim question, an interesting question they were asking. And they came to a unanimous conclusion eventually. 
that the characteristic most important to acquire is that of self-awareness. And self-awareness means the ability to understand how our words, our gestures and actions, and even our presence are experienced by other people. Self-awareness doesn't mean I'm aware of what I'm feeling. That's easy. Self-awareness is I'm aware of what you feel when I'm talking. Self-awareness is I'm aware of what you feel when I walk into the room, what you feel when I do certain things. That's self-awareness. And self-awareness, as important as it is in leadership, is equally important in the process of Triva. And we had great examples of it over the last uh, 40 minutes or so in, in Rav Shefter's talk. How self-aware we need to be, not only of ourselves, but of the way we're impacting the people around us in order to be able to do Tshuva. And I have to tell you that for over 30 years, I've been training and developing leaders of Fortune 500 companies and many others around the world. And the hardest thing for them to master is self-mastery. If self-mastery is so foundational to effective leadership and just to be an effective human being, why do we find it so hard? And you might not realize how hard we find it, but I've seen the data because, because we do it. Uh, we, we do constantly tests where we check what people think others feel about them and what people actually do feel about them. And we measure the gap. And the gap is enormous mostly. Most people have no clue at all about how their words land on other people, how other people experience their leadership style, how other people experience their behavior. Even in marriage counseling, husbands and wives have no clue. And that's why you'll have a husband who will say, how many times have I said to her that I love her? That's not the point. It's communication is not about what you said. Communication is about what the other person felt about what you said. And we tend to focus on what we say, and we don't focus enough on, and how does the other person made to feel by what I say and what I do? And that's very, very difficult to develop, an understanding and appreciation of that. And in trying to understand why that is, why we find self-mastery so difficult, I came to the title of tonight's talk. Because self-awareness is a pain. It's so much easier to sail through life oblivious of the havoc that you wreak as you move through your life. It's so much easier not to be aware of what you're doing, what you're causing, what your words are causing, and just to go through obliviously. You see people who drive that way. You see people who walk that way. You see people who talk that way. You see people who do business that way, just oblivious of what effect this is really having on other people. Because once you start becoming aware of the effect, it's very painful. And what I want to look at you with you at this evening is how self-awareness generates pain, how it generates shame, and how it also generates gain. Not all negative. It's not all about pain and shame. There's a lot of gain in it as well. Let's look at examples of each. The pain of self-awareness. Rav Cook wrote a work that many people are not very familiar with, and I think primarily because it's very, very difficult. Uh, it's the only work he actually wrote. Everything else that we have of Rav Cook was written by his son and by his, by his Talmudian. But the journals that he kept, he wrote in his own hand. And he didn't write them for publication, but we've got them and they're published. And they are poetic and they are beautiful. And he says, among so many other things, the following. And I want to read you the words. Siman tohu la'adam vela'uma. It's a good sign, both for an individual and for the nation. When the ethical character of a person evolves and develops, or the ethical character of a, nature, of a nation or a community evolves and develops. 
יפה מכיר הוא בכל פגם מוסרי של עצמו. A highly evolved character is enormously aware of every flaw in his character. והוא נסלד ממנו, and he is disgusted by it. A very sensitive person, a very evolved person, becomes disgusted with his own flaws. And that's the pain. And because it causes us disgust, we prefer not to look at it. We prefer to turn our faces away from it. But that pain, as you'll say in a moment, is very important for us. יש גם שההכרה המוסרית מקדמת היא את עצמה הרבה מהיכולת המוסרית החופשית. Sometimes this awareness is more developed and evolved than the capacity to do anything about it. And that's additionally painful. ואז הוספת דעת זה תוסיף מהחובים רבים. And that becomes even more painful. Now I'm aware of my flaws, I'm aware of my inadequacies, I'm aware of where I fall short. And I can't really fix it. I'm not evolved enough to fix it. I'm evolved enough to understand it, but not evolved enough to fix it. Because he can see with wide open eyes, with total clarity, how the ethical tears, the rips, Beautiful word in his character. Hem ma'anim et nishmato. They afflict his soul. And here you've got a completely different level of self-awareness. So some people think self-awareness is being aware of yourself. And we've said, no, self-awareness is not just being aware of yourself. It's how others experience you. Rav Kook says there's a third level. To be aware of how your own soul experiences you. What are you doing to your neshama with the flaws in your character? So as you start becoming aware, Rav Shechter was talking before, how difficult it is to ask Mechila from another human being. As I become aware of what I've done wrong to another person, what do I do about it? I might have the awareness, can I really repair it? Can I fix it? That's a different capacity. And so it is with our own development. But to be aware not only of what I might have done to somebody else, but what I might have done to myself. How has my activity damaged my soul? And what can I do about that? Because our soul doesn't only get damaged by others. Our bodies get damaged by others. But our souls get damaged by ourselves. We damage ourselves. And as we become self-aware and conscious about that, that becomes incredibly painful. But when Chazal talk about Yisurei Ava, the pain of love, that Hashem sometimes allows us to feel pain out of love for us, this is what it means. The pain you feel when you see your own inadequacies and how those inadequacies are undermining your own neshama, that pain, that suffering, is Yisurei Ava. Because sof kol sof meviim heim et ha'ora ha'gvura. Because they will bring enormous energy and light. If you just allow yourself to sit with that pain and to understand it and to feel it, it will bring you to, to the beginnings of rectifying, of doing something about it. Rather than sailing through your life totally unaware of what you're doing to yourself, what you're doing to other people, and what you're doing to your own neshama. Rather to feel that pain, it's okay to feel the pain. If you feel pain, you're alive. If you stop feeling pain, you're no longer alive. And this is part of the pain. This is emotional pain. This is the pain of self-awareness. The more self-aware we become, the more pain we inflict upon ourselves. But that discomfort and that pain is the driver and motivator of repair, of correction, of evolution, and of growth. It's one of the tragedies of the human condition that we don't make changes if we're not uncomfortable. Sometimes we create our own discomfort. That's what ambition is. I've reached a certain status in life and I'm not happy. I want to be more. And that gap creates discomfort and the discomfort drives me to accomplish what I've set out to accomplish. I've got a, a, a university degree, but I want my master's. I want a PhD. That 
desire for something more than I've got creates discomfort, and the discomfort drives me to close the gap. So sometimes we create our own discomfort, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes discomfort is created by the environment or by other people, and that brings about change. It can cause us to emigrate. It can cause us to terminate a relationship. It can cause us to change jobs. We change our circumstance when the pain gets heavy, when we feel uncomfortable. And the discomfort of self-awareness is the driver of spiritual growth. And during this time of the Asertiva Chuvan, especially on Yom Kippur, that's the time to sit in the pain of self-awareness, to feel it, to acknowledge it, and to strive to repair it. What about the shame of self-awareness? The source of the shame of self-awareness comes in Parashat Vayigash and Parashat Vayichi. Vayiruet Yosef Kimeit Avihem, Yosef, Vayiru Achei Yosef Kimeit Avihem, Yosef's brothers realize now Yaakov has died, Vayomru, and they say, Lu Yistemenu Yosef, Vayishev Yashiv Lanu et Kol HaRashel Gamal Noto. Oh my goodness, they say, now our father's gone. Can you just imagine what Yosef is going to do to us? He's been so kind to us all these years because our father's been alive and he didn't want to cause Agmas Nefesh to the father. But now that the father has died, he's going to take it out on us. Who knows what he's going to do to us? That word, Lu Yistamenu, is a strange word. And Rashi comments on how strange it is. And he says the word Lu means Shema Yistamenu. Maybe he'll hate us. Perhaps Yosef will start to hate us now. And Rashi says, Lu mitchalek linyanim harbe. This word Lu can mean many different things in the Torah. Yesh lo yesh lu mishamesh balashon bakasha balashon halavai. Sometimes, mostly, Lu means if only. I wish that. Sometimes it means maybe, perhaps. And there's no other case but this where the word lu means that. The word lu means in this case, Shema. Maybe he will hate us. Perhaps now that our father is dead, he will hate us. But says Rashi, there's nowhere else in the Torah where that's what lu means. There's a beautiful idea by Reb Mordechai Goldstein. He was the founder of Yeshivat HaTfutzot, who played a very important part at the beginnings of the, of the Baal Tshuva movement. And he says, Lu Yistamenu Yosef, Lu means exactly what Lu always means. Lu Yistamenu Yosef, if only Yosef would hate us now. We're actually wishing that Yosef would hate us. Because what has Yosef done up till now? Don't be upset that you sold me here. And you don't beat yourselves up that you sold me to Egypt. Hashem sent, you, sent me here to provide for you. This was all planned. Don't worry about it. And the brothers are dying of embarrassment and shame. If only he would hate us. If only he would yell at us. If only he would tell us what he's really thinking and feeling instead of this kindness and kindness and kindness. We don't deserve the kindness. That's what Lu Yistamenu means. And we see that idea in, in, in something the Baal Shem Tov said on the Posuk of El Nekamot Hashem, El Nekamot Hofia. The God of vengeance is Hashem. The God of vengeance has appeared. And the word for God that is used is Yudke Vavke. And that's the, that's the God of Chesed. So if you're talking about the God of vengeance, it should say, Kel Nekamot Elohim. Elohim is the God of judgment, is the stern, the strict God. It should say, Kel Nekamot Elohim. What is Kel Nekamot Hashem? Hashem, you're extracting vengeance from us, the God of kindness. What does that mean? And the Baal Shem Tov says it means, Sometimes God extracts vengeance from us with kindness. If you are sensitive, then one of the most painful things is to be treated well by somebody you treated badly. It's actually painful. 
If you're not sensitive, it's nothing. You don't feel a thing. But if you're a sensitive person and you've done something wrong to somebody and they're kind back to you, they're forgiving, they're kind, they're loving, they're accepting, that creates a deep sense of embarrassment and shame. And you don't know what to do about it. It's very hard. You want to apologize? And the person says, what are you apologizing for? Forget it. It's nothing. But you know, it wasn't nothing. You know, it was terrible. You embarrassed them. You took their job away from them. You caused them a terrible loss. No, don't worry about it. We're friends. Everything's okay. And you know it can't be. So what do you do? How do you get mechila? We were talking about before the mechila ben adam lechaviro. How do you get mechila ben adam lechaviro with somebody who just comes back at you with kindness when you've been nasty and, and impossibly difficult to them? That's kel nechamot Hashem, kel nechamot Sophia. Sometimes Hashem showers us with kindness in the hope that we will feel so embarrassed about all the kindness he's given us that we will change our ways. That's one of the drachim of, of, of Hashem. And the same applies after the Egil Hazav, after the golden calf. What did Hashem do? He gave us the Mishka. He didn't destroy us. Yeah, he got angry for a little while, but at the end of it, out of that came the Mishkan. With all the avodah of all the avoda of Yom Kippur and the day-to-day -day avoda, everything that comes with it, we got that as a result of the eagle. We do this terrible thing, and and we we demonstrate unfaithfulness to God. We're dancing around the golden calf, and God says, "Don't worry, I'll give you a mishkan. You want to dance around something? Here's a mishkan. You can serve me in the mishkan." And that makes us feel even worse. That, that Hashem treats us that, that way. And it's very important that in our lives we become conscious of that and realize, particularly at this time of the year, not only to sit in fear of what God might do and what God might have done, but to look back on life at all the brachot we have, at all the goodness and the kindness. Yes, we all have our difficulties. We've all been through challenges, some more, some less. But we've also all had brachot. We've all had wonderful things happening to us. This year, last year, the previous years, we've had incredible experiences. We need to pause and say, do we really deserve what we've had, the goodness that we've had? People often ask, why do bad things happen to good people? But sometimes the question is, why do good things happen to bad people? We're not all good. There are aspects of us that aren't that good. And yet Hashem gives us a good life. Why? And that awareness, that shame that comes through that self-awareness, I'm aware that the goodness you're giving me is goodness that I haven't really deserved. We see this in an amazing Rashbo. The Rashbo says in Masech the Brochus on the Gemara, where Rabbi Yochan says in the name of Rabbi Shime ben Yochai, that Miyom Shebara Kurush Boruchu et Olamo, Loba Adam Shehodela Kurush Boruchu, Ad Shebat Lea Vodato, Shinema Apam Odea Kashem. Until Leah came, nobody knew how to thank Hashem. Nobody knew how to say Baruch Hashem. Leah was the inventor of the term Baruch Hashem. Nobody said it before. Nobody knew how to. What does that mean? Explains the Rashbo. When does Leah thank Hashem for her children? Not after her first child is born. Not after her second child is born. Not after the third child is born. Only after Yehuda is born. And Yehuda is from Choda'a, thankfulness. She's not thankful for the first three children. Says the Rashbo, she knew she was going to have the first three children because she knew that Yaakov was going to have 12 Shvatim and he had four wives. So each wife was going to get three children. So the first three children were not a gift. The first, first three children were part of the evolutionary plan of Hashem. This is how the nation was going to develop. We were going to be 12 shvatim coming from four mothers and one forefather from Yaakov. And that means her three sons is just part of the plan. When she had a fourth son, she realized this is more than I deserve. This is more than my fair share. This needs hoda'a. And she teaches the world what hoda'a means. Hoda'a means I don't deserve what you've given me. And that's what we've got to say when we're saying thank you. If you think you deserve it, you don't have to say thank you. If you've worked for a month to, for your employer and he gives you a check at the end of the month, you don't have to say thank you. Thank you for paying me. That's the deal. I get paid at the end of the month. But if your employer says, 
here's your salary for the month, and here's extra. Yom Tov's coming, you need extra money for Yom Tov, and you've worked well this month, I want to give you something extra. There, you've got to say thank you. That's already more than I deserve. That's more than the contract. That's more than the deal. That's what Hoda means, but that means that's how we've got to say Hod, thank you. Thank you isn't just a curse, courtesy, just thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you means you've got to say thank you with the heartfelt energy of, this is more than I deserve. You didn't have to do this. Um, if somebody comes to you for dinner and brings you a, a bouquet of flowers and a bottle of wine, if you feel you deserve it, they're getting a free dinner, you're getting a bottle of wine, it's okay. Then you don't have to say thank you in exchange. But if you feel that's not, they didn't need to do that at all. You're having them because you really just want to have them. You're enjoying it. Then when they bring you the bottle of wine or the bouquet of flowers and you say thank you, the thank you comes from a place of, I don't deserve this. Why are you even doing this? I'm so fortunate that you took the trouble to do something for me, which I haven't earned. That's what thank you means, hoda'ah, that comes from Yehuda. After the three sons to say and realize, the time to say thank you is when you recognize you've received more than you deserve. And most of us, he's speaking for myself, look at our lives and can quite easily say, we've received more than we deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Rebbein Shalom. And in that thank you comes another word. What is the word related to Hoda'a and connected with this period of time? Vidui. What's the connection between Vidui and Hoda'a? Confession and thank you. That's what thank you is. I confess I don't deserve this. That's what Vidui is. And when we say Ashamnu Bagadnu on Yom Kippur, what we're saying is, Rebbeinu you've done so much good for me that I don't deserve because Ashamnu Bagadnu Gazalnu, and you just keep doing good for me, even while I'm speaking Loshon Hora, even while I'm being while I'm being dishonest in business, while I'm doing that, you're giving me life, you're sustaining me, you never stop with your kindness, even when I'm betraying you. That's what Vidu is about. Vidu is understanding that Hashem's goodness far exceeds anything we deserve. And that enables us to take a little more of a positive look at, at, at Yom Kippur. But we need to be evolved enough to be able to feel that shame. I'm actually ashamed, Rabbi Hashem, that I am not deserving of what you've given me. I'm grateful to you. I thank you, and I confess that I'm not deserving of it. That's the shame. What about the gain in self-awareness? We know the Torah is critical of Lashon Hara, even when it's about inanimate objects. And the biggest example, of course, is the Miraglim, with the, the case of, uh, of, of the spies talking about Eretz Israel. But even talking badly about an object, the Torah is, is not at all happy about Hashem doesn't like that. And why is that so, and what does it really mean? Ilan Chazen very beautiful story that I've never heard before. In the name of Yaakov Kamenetsky, who told the story about the Chofetz Chaim, who was on a mission with a colleague, with another Rav. And they were traveling, and they had to be away several nights, and they were staying in an inn in a particular town or village in Eastern Europe, Poland. And they're sitting in the inn, and they go in for dinner to the inn, and they eat. Innkeeper is, is very honored to have them there and realizes this is the Chofetz Chaim and she makes the best effort she could possibly to give them a beautiful dinner. When they finish dinner, she comes up to them and says, did you enjoy? Was everything all right? Chofetz Chaim says, absolutely beautiful. Everything was wonderful. The other rabbi says, you know what? If you're actually asking for feedback like on TripAdvisor, I've got to tell you there wasn't any salt in the soup. Would it be nicer if there was salt in the soup? You should just know that. She walks away, and the Chofetz Chaim tears into his friend and says, I've given my life to, to fight Loshon Hora, and you just taught Loshon Hora about the soup? And the rabbi says, please, Chofetz Chaim, it's just soup. I didn't talk Loshon Hora about anybody else. And it wasn't so serious. She asked, and she wants to improve her service. So I just told her the truth. Says the Chofetz Chaim, you have no clue what you've caused. He said, I don't. What have I caused? He said, just think it through. 
she goes into the kitchen and she calls the cook. And the cook is a widow from the town that's supposed to do the cooking in the inns. And she says to the cook, what did you do? The Chofetz Chaim was here for dinner and you didn't put salt in the soup. You're fired. Get out of here. And the widow will lose her job because you couldn't keep your mouth closed. Oh, says Chofetz Chaim, you're being dramatic. Well, let's go and have a look. Let's go to the kitchen and see what's happened. And I hear the arguments and the tears and the firing exactly as the Chofetz Chaim said. Chofetz Chaim said to him, you live your life in the dining room without thinking about what's going on in the kitchen. That's self-awareness. To be able to live in the dining room and realize the impact you're having in the kitchen. It's what Ray Dalio calls second and third order consequences. Realize the domino effect of the things you're saying and the things you're doing. That's self-awareness. When one becomes aware of that, and you think, so why does Hashem forbid all this Lashon Hara, not just about people, but even about things? It's just because it's such negative energy. Lashon Hara just, and we know, and we know the dinim, it destroys the speaker, it destroys the listener, it destroys the person about whom you're speaking. Why does it destroy all of them? I understand it damages the person about who you're speaking with. Why does it damage the person who's speaking and the person who's listening? Because it's so negative. It's so draining. It pulls you down. It destroys your life, the negativity of it. And I say to you, when you turn on the news or you go onto, onto news on your computers or you read a newspaper, how much of what you're reading is Lush and Horror? How much of it is Lush and Horror? See, you might say, it's news. I need to know what the news is. There used to be a time when the news was about events and about opinions and about policies. Now the news is only about people, and it's usually not complimentary. So you pick up, you turn on the news, you pick up the paper, just lush and horror, and lush and horror, and lush and horror. What does that do? What does that do to your neshama, as Rav Cook says? How does that damage your own neshama, just hearing this negative talk all the time, over and over again? Even the demonstrations that are going on all the time, and I'm not getting involved at all as to whether they're right or they're right or who's right. Different, different topic. But the negativity, the constant undermining both sides, one for the other, but all you hear is this ongoing drone of Lashon Hora day and night, day after day. What does that do to us? What does that do to the atmosphere? What does that do to the social fabric? What's happening in the kitchen when we're doing that? What's happening to the people who are working in the kitchen? We shouldn't live our lives in the dining room without being aware of what's happening in the kitchen. And so if we think of these three areas of self-awareness, the impact of our character flaws on our own souls and our ability to repair that, to fix that, to grow and to develop. The gap between what we've been given and who we are and feeling shame that we are not of a statue deserving all the blessing we've been given and doing something about that too. And filtering out the negative conversation that happens around us because we might be living in the dining room, but we're also aware of what's happening in the kitchen. And as we develop these higher and higher levels of self-awareness, as uncomfortable as it is, it enables us to grow as human beings to grow as families, to grow as communities, to grow as a nation. Every form of spiritual growth needs this level of self-awareness in order for it to happen. And what better time is there than now, over the next few days, and particularly on Yom Kippur itself, just to sit with that awareness and to question, what are some of the things I'm doing, doing to my own soul? In what way have I really earned the wonderful things I've been given? And in what way does the negative talk I hear about me all the time destroy the people in the kitchen? And how can I isolate myself from that and insulate myself from that, that I'm not pulled down with that, but that somehow I can focus my attention on things that are elevated, that are worthy, that are important, uh, and, and that are praiseworthy.
So I leave you with those thoughts at this time of the year. Not not comfortable thoughts, but um, that's it. this isn't the time of year for comfort, isn't that right? It's uh, Rosh Hashanah is, is quite a comfortable Yom Tov, and Hashem does a lot of tessel in giving us Rosh Hashanah first. But then the Aseret Shem Chuba, we get into areas of deeper discomfort. In Yom Kippur, we get into still deeper areas of discomfort. But it's that very discomfort that we experience on Yom Kippur. But as Rav Kook says, they are Yisurin Ahavahem. Sof kol sof beviimheim et ha'ora ha'gmura. The pain, the embarrassment, the discomfort that we feel on Yom Kippur will lead to the joy, to the energy, to the upliftment, which will lead us to Sukkot and to days of Simcha for the rest of the year and the time ahead of us. Good evening, thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi Lappin. I want to just end by thanking Marty Kaufman for having the idea, for having this evening, encouraging me. Thank you very much. I now feel much more prepared for you, Kipper, and I'm sure that all sitting here as well. Thank you very much.